This is episode 385 of JumboThink. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to JumboThink, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality too. Our guest on today's show is Dr. Anhil Iskovich. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, if you've never subscribed to JumboThink, now's the time to do it. Head on over to wherever you listen to podcasts, search for JumboThink, and click subscribe. To make it even easier, if you head on over to JumboThink.com, you'll find links to Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, and more. Never miss an episode of JumboThink? Go subscribe to the show now. Now let's join today's conversation. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Jumble Think. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have a great conversation lined up for you today. Our guest is Dr. Anhil Iskovich. He is a CEO, doctor, telehealth expert, thought leader, and better known as Dr. I to his patients, his colleagues, and his friends. He has a brand new book out called Routineology, The Art of Routine. Well, let's go ahead and join today's guest, Dr. I. Our guest today is Dr. Onhil Iskovich. I'm super, super excited to have you on. You're Obviously, uh, you're an immigrant from Argentina, which there's a big story there that's super cool. Uh, welcome to JumboThink. Thank you. Thank you. What a great pleasure and uh, been able to follow you a little bit and what a great show you have. Thank you. That's very kind of you. There is a lot to cover here in your adventures. We'll call them that. You have a diverse set of interests. We were talking before line about, uh, on, offline about... Um, flying planes. We were talking about that. We were talking about your journeys into entrepreneurship and CEO. We talked about uh, your doctoral degree, which is in psychology, right? I think. Well, actually, I'm a physician. I'm, it's in medicine. Okay. Uh, but I trained in, I trained originally in psychiatry and then became an emergency physician for most of my medical career, that aspect of it, clinical. Yeah. Career. I I find it fascinating that you've been in so many different spaces and you've, you're have you in the world of AI now too, and you run a company that does that. How are, have you navigated all of these different pivots and different interests that seem so detached from each other? You look at health and healthcare to uh, technology and AI. You look at uh, planes, which who doesn't, well, there are people who don't like to fly, but they need help. That's a different story for a different day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, yeah, yeah, well, well, actually they, they're a little more coherent, uh, uh, as, as I like to talk about routine, coherent, co coherent routines make for, uh, good things, good meaning and purpose in life. And, uh, yeah. they make for, uh, for, uh, you know, having, uh, hopefully good longevity and high performance in the sort, but, um, I think it's true that my I have a, a philosophical approach, mm. and that that probably came early. You know, my parents were uh, both uh, concentration camp uh, survivors. My mother wow. was in Auschwitz, and in the book Art of Routine, I tell one story about even in the worst crisis, how a little bit of routine and organization and structure can help you survive. And um, I think from that, I think the concepts of survival. Uh, have kind of always been in in my a little bit in my background how you survive how one thrives how we move forward and um, um, when I you know got interest in, in in medicine of course medicine is a science it has a lot of technology that's involved <laughs> I know a lot of friends that are physicians that are pilots because there's a certain uh, interest of course in physics and in understanding kind of how um, the technology and the aspects of actually whether you're in an operating room doing an operating procedure or flying an airplane, there's a lot of, there are, there are some similarities to that. And uh, I got involved in emergency medicine very early in the first onsets in the eighties, early, early, in the late seventies and the early eighties when emergency medicine was uh, just beginning as a field, you know, prior to that in emergency departments, you might have your psychiatrist or your dermatologist doing a rotation, but yeah. as the uh, cardiac and, uh, 
and um, cardiac care and trauma care became more specialized, physicians who could do that in an organized manner to provide in a certain amount of uncertainty, but was coming through the door, um, had kind of that type of attitude uh, and could could work together to help, uh, in essence, care for patients and save lives in difficult situations. That that became kind of a thrust. I and uh, at that mo- at that moment in time, just as a little point of history and trying to put this all together, I there was hospitals were looking for um, physicians to staff their emergency departments. It was a new field, and yeah. it became kind of an outsourced field. That instead of hospitals hiring emergency physicians businesses began to develop and they asked me to start a few emergency departments. And I thought, well, you know, I could do this. I'll get some good doctors. And then there's this whole management piece as medicine became more complex, you know, having to build people, malpractice. And most of the people that are ER docs wanted to come in with a white coat and stethoscope and just work. It was shift work, it was hospital based work, which is something that I evolved more into doing physician management mm. in areas of people that work in the hospital, like radiologists and uh, anesthesiologists, hospitalists today, and emergency physicians. And that's how kind of grew into that business and eventually ended up uh, merging my company with a large company um, that does both, uh, did it both ambulance transportations, uh, you might know that company AMR, and then mm-hmm. in, in Vision or MCare. And we kind of grew into a, a pretty large multi-billion dollar publicly traded company and I had that the, the the pleasure and the experience of being able to then manage and grow within within that large uh, that large institution, and that's kind of how how it all kind of uh, kind of it all connects. So there's a little bit of of um, you know medicine, and I think that's a little bit of why when I um, noted this observation in the book, The Art of Routine, how it all came about, it, it has, uh, you know, it has some medical roots to it that, uh, you know, I'd be glad to talk about or whatever you'd like to talk about. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned The Art of Routine. That comes out May 18th. What was the, this isn't your first book. That's the first thing. Uh, this is your second book? No, it's actually, it, technically, it's actually my first book. Okay. And I've used a couple good contributors and co-authors and Joe Gardner, Michael Ashley to work with me. I have done a lot of other publications, but they've been, uh, other publications have been more technical or, you know, medical okay. in nature. And I've done some other writing, but technically uh, in the sense of a, a book that a publishing company uh, wanted to publish in the sort and Skyhorse Publishing with Simon Schuster Distribution. So yeah. it's, a, it's, it's in essence, truly the first book. Well, tell me about the in the ring, though. Let's pivot well, there the, for the a ring, second. Yeah, so I think you looked a little bit at our website. So we've got this uh, this piece that's uh, this is another part of my eclectic nature. <laughs> um, I this is a and and and, it, it, and it's not particularly entrepreneurial, but it but it is uh, competitive, so to speak. It, yeah. In the ring came about and is a little bit in the background. It's a book that's already been well outlined. It's having interest in publication, but I decided to just focus on the art of routine. And In the Ring is about the show dog world. Oh, and wow. uh, and uh, many uh, many people have seen uh, the, uh, the movie, uh, the, the, the movie, The Best in Show, yeah. you know, which many people have seen, which is a funny kind of uh, a mockumentary, they call it, I think, <laughs> of, of the dog show world and all these people that are in it. But somehow, uh, partly through the interest of my wife and otherwise, we've we've always had some dogs, and and somehow I ended up buying a show dog. Yeah, um, that kind of I fell in love with, and when I bought that dog, uh, a miniature Schnauzer, it ended up that um, this miniature Schnauzer was going to be. I had to show him if I wanted to buy him, and I fell in love with him. And I said, okay, what does that mean? And we understood a little bit about what happens at. Uh, you know, at Westminster and around the world and what dog shows are about uh, from some other event. My wife had done some, it's it shown horses in the past. She grew up in a, in a ranch and a farm and a, and the sort. So I got into the show world and suddenly I, I kind of saw this whole other world. Yeah. Um, that was extremely diverse from backyard Mississippi breeders to billionaires and to this world that uh, travels throughout and my interest was more as it is in behavior in general, just as as the inside of art routine is about why is routine and stable environments, why are we wired that way? Why would people be going around showing this, these dogs, you know? And why do they do this and travel 
year round and compete with these animals in a sport, not too dissimilar as golfers or tennis uh, tours and the sort, it's a little different. So I became really interested in, in that aspect of it and wondering also who made the money in that world. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I've learned that it's not the owners of the dogs. It's the people that service the animals. It's the groomers and the, the breeders and, uh, and uh, the handlers and the people that do this. So um, that book is kind of just on the, on the brink of, of coming, something coming out and hoping that it, it has a certain appeal to what the real best in show is about. And why people ask me, why did you do dog show? Uh, why did you even go in the dog show world? I said, you know, sometimes when you're too old to compete, you get your animals to do it for you. That's, <laughs> that's what I, that's what I've told them, you know? And, and so, um, and, and surely, you know, competition is an important part of our human nature and in, in trying to, you know, better ourselves or do well. So um, that's the other book. I grew up having dogs. I grew up in South central Pennsylvania and uh, I never watched the dog show growing up uh, or anything like that. And we had a friend when we were in California who her tradition was every year at Thanksgiving after the Macy's parade, which was my tradition, her and her family would watch the Westminster dog show. And so uh, that was my first exposure to that show and just the pacing and uh, and and what they do is, is quite interesting. I, I want to circle back to this book, The Art of Routine. What was the spark for this book? What was the reason why you went, this is something I need to write about? Well, you know, it it, um, it was just kind of this, this kind of macro insight uh, about connecting what was an observation of our nature and how maybe that works with our body, you know, bringing the medicine and scientific side. And about 10 or 15 years ago, we were opening up and beginning to study how to do um, geriatric emergency departments. We were mm. looking that if someone that was over 65 or 70 came to the emergency department, that we would set up a special section because like children who we used to say, well, children are not little adults. You know, they have very <laughs> special needs. Yeah. People, as they get older, and this happens through our, our aging process, um, have also special needs. You know, you might be very ill, but not have a fever, for example. That's mm. things that happen as you get into older age. And so we were setting up specialized segments of the ERs. And I was at the time overseeing about 200 of these uh, facilities with many physicians. So we were starting to beta test it. And I got interested in, uh, in, in longevity and in people that were over 100 years of age. Um, I've got interested in what they call centenarians or centigenarians. Yeah. And I interviewed some of them and tried to look at how you know, their uh, medical conditions changed from an age of 70 to 100. But as I interviewed and studied them, I learned that there were two things that seemed in common with all of these uh, centigenarians that had long lives. One was that they had a stable environment, both physical, where they lived or where they went about, and a physical and also an emotionally supportive environment of who was around them. And the second thing that I noticed was that they did things with tremendous routine, with great time and great regularity. Um, they did they did these with really quite a bit of organization and structure. But what struck me is that what was that's what was common. But what wasn't common was what they did during those times. Oh, interesting. They, they actually varied, and so the concept of doing things regularly in a stable environment, but what it is you do kind of varied, and in okay. fact it was somewhat. In a way, that's why it's called the art of routine, because the content of what you do is somewhat something that, you know, some people, of course, have choices in doing, some don't, but you more or less has a certain art to it. For example, I see people living to 100 and say, boy, they've lived a healthy life. And I'd say, well, I just interviewed a lady that that she has this, um, she drinks she drinks a, um, a scotch every day at five o'clock. <laughs> He has meat on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It never deviates from it. Um, and what we would consider a healthy diet, would it wouldn't be a healthy diet. Whereas others might have other extremely varied practices. You know, well, I used to walk a mile, but now I walk a quarter of a mile, but I do it every day at 4.30, you know, and we do it regularly. So they there was the routine 
the stable environment where they lived or where they are, but what they did varied. And it mm. got me to thinking about high performers. Okay. Uh, people that, um, that were um, performing, uh, let's say in sports or artists in the sort. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and then it got me to thinking about how we care for our young. Because when we're bringing up children, we put quite a bit of organization and structure. There's a lot of routine, a lot of habit. It's not a haphazard issue. And I thought about uh, good businesses and some of the things that came naturally to some of our businesses and how they're organized and structured and what routines they have and what rituals. And the companies that were high performers had these qualities. And I asked myself the question, why is that? Why would that be? And I started to think about the fact that if you look at our bodies and the, how we perceive our world, there's tremendous amount of routine and regularity mm -hmm. in how our bodies work and the world that we perceive. From the sun, this is kind of a more macro philosophical piece <laughs> that, goes into, that goes into psychology and then into how our brains work and how our bodies work. And I started to realize that we have kind of a circadian rhythm, yeah. a very well-known rhythm about how our cortisol, our adrenocorticoids, when we're most awake, when we best engage, when we best sleep, uh, I realize that our hearts beat regularly. They're not irregular. Yeah. But, uh, and the world we perceive, the sun comes up and goes down. And imagine if the sun didn't come up, how it would <laughs> make for some uncertainty in a moment. So I connected the concepts that really this is part of how uh, we survive, that it's how we're wired. We're mm -hmm. wired for routine, for stability to gain equilibrium, homeostasis, that's how our bodies actually work. And that's kind of how I connected this and got me uh, inspired to say, well, that's somewhat of a, a more unique uh, insight um, mm -hmm. into other than just the observation of us, uh, why we do what we do. But it, it made me then think as we were just starting the pandemic and I was writing the book about how our lives have now become disruptive, how there is a lot of uncertainty, how we've all of a sudden realized how important our environment is. Now we've had to change our routines. And prior to that, a lot of my thinking was related to the fact that in our world, I call it kind of an infinite age of distraction right now. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of disruption, uh, yeah. a lot of... Um, um, a lot of disruption, a lot of uh, interruption, an inability to get into any routine, any rhythm, yeah. uh, momentum. There's a lot of points about that. So that's kind of how it started. And I started looking for stories and individuals of people that kind of exemplified those concepts. So that's, yeah. that's the inspiration. Maybe a little more than you might want to know, but that's how it came together. <laughs> We're going to take a break right here, but in a moment, we'll be back to continue the conversation. It is hard to believe that we are getting close to episode 400 of the Jumble Think podcast. There's a lot happening here behind the scenes. I know I've been teasing it out for a while, but we are bringing you video very, very soon. All of these conversations live in real time, right to YouTube and right to Facebook. I don't want you to miss a thing. I don't want you to miss these conversations. So head on over to jumblethink.com where you can sign up for our newsletter, never miss one of these conversations, and also get entered to win some really cool prizes along the way. That's jumblethink.com. Go sign up for that newsletter and never miss anything here at Jumblethink. Now let's continue the conversation with Dr. I. I've been jotting notes down here. I, uh, I, I believe in pen and paper uh, for a guy who owned a web agency still does, uh, for years built stuff in high tech works in Silicon Valley. Uh, I love my pen and paper more than I do on, uh, working on my computer. And, yeah. and so as we're going through, I'm just writing tons and tons of notes and observations on what you're saying. I, I, I want to step back and look at this. You know, some people will say, okay, you look at these people who live to a hundred and, it seems like the structure seems mundane. When we think of significant things, we think of like people who are shaking up things all the time and they're always like innovating and, and, right. you know, but it seems like 
these patterns, these rhythms of life, these routines don't have to limit the fulfillment of life from the standpoint of innovation or from exploration or from adventure, but it's it's more of a pattern of life that that brings health. Is is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say. And and you know, it's not Groundhog Day. Yeah. But, you know, so I think you were kind of getting at that. Right? Yeah, that's that's what I I'm often, getting to. Yeah. Yeah. I often get asked that. And um so the nature of 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 how we're wired and the life that we live will make, and I call it, I, I, I try to make some analogy. I'm not sure it fits well, but I think it does. It's called a time bubble. Okay. And I think of our environment as the bubble and yeah. time is our routine. Yeah. But what you do within that routine, how, what you choose to do, when you choose to do it, even though there may be better times, that's your choice. That's what you do. But as life goes on, just like as I begin the book with recognizing how we come from this womb, this stable yeah. womb before we're born, that it has actually a lot of rhythm and routine going to it. And then we're born, thrown out into this world <laughs> uh, that it, for humans, we protect ourselves and then teach ourselves structure and teach ourselves socialization that as we go through life, our time bubbles burst <laughs> and we then have to recreate, you know, new environments in, 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 in new times. And so um, the, the fact that it, it's more important when you're young and, and you see it more active and people that have lived longer lives, more, more routine, more stability that you try, one tries to create. We go through life because of the nature of life and surviving by having events that are external or external kind of burst our, our bubble, change our times, whether it's, uh, could be divorce, you know, marriage, death, different losses, loss of jobs, businesses. And that's when we be innovate. And that's when we begin to create what else we do. The, the, the point about it is that whatever it is you decide to do, once you can get away from all the distractions, you know, and find what you do, is to do it regularly, to yeah. do it in a routine, to try to find a stable environment. And the hopeful part of this is that you have to understand that's how we're wired. Yeah, yeah. Survive. Yeah. Even, yeah. As so, even as social groups, this is how we're wired. So that you have to understand, short of having, you know, certain medical issues or behavioral issues or disease that our bodies and the way we're wired is to find that stability, to find that routine. It may be short lived. It may be longer lived, <laughs> yeah. but that's how, that's the nature of, 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 of how we are. Now you mentioned, you talked to this one lady who she drinks scotch every day at 4 PM. She, uh, you know, you talk to these different people and, and, whether it's like a Tim Ferriss type person or Simon Sinek, a lot of that is about like hacking s systems to make them work for us. About yeah. like creating systems that, that uh, in this case of, the, of the, the people in that example, longevity. I'm trying to hack longevity. How do I get to where they've gone? How do I create that same thing? And it can seem overwhelming to a person listening right now that they're going, well, We've got health, we've got work, we've got family. These are all different routines. We've got to stack all of them. It seems overwhelming to find healthy rhythms, those circadian rhythms that you were talking about. How can somebody really start practicing routines, almost like rituals or habits that are patterns of life that bring health or maybe mental clarity? What are the elements that they need to look at to create that holistic routine? Right. So, I mean, part of the part of your the assumption of your question is that one doesn't have one or one mm. would like to improve upon what they're doing or change what they're doing, right? Yeah. I think so. So you you if you understand a little bit of our of about our brain physiology, not just our not just the circadian rhythms about the when you would do what you do, when it's better. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know when things I like circadian rhythms because you know, there's a reason that at three o'clock, the uh, English have tea and the uh, Spanish cultures have a siesta. Yeah. And some of the French and Italian cultures have sex. You know, this <laughs> is modeled after the hypothalamus and what happens in your hypothalamus during that period of time when your glucose and your corticoid go down. And here you are trying to have a really cognitive, very detailed meeting. We're having it right now, really. So, yeah, yeah. you know, so we have to be, although... I'm I'm right in the engagement, good engagement period. You're now 
past it into past that period of time, re-energize where you could do exercise in the sort. So part of it is under to find the right places first to look within and see where have been the barriers. Where's where's things not going quite right? When are you having the right meetings? When are you trying to be productive? And if you start by understanding a little bit of that, the way to begin these in, in, in these areas. And here's the thing, the way the brain works and gives you a little dopamine to give you a reinforcement in the sort, it begins by routine, uh, begets routine. Now remember habit is more of an automated behavior. Okay. Routine is just about doing things at a certain time. Some habits are done at a good time at the same time. Some aren't. Okay. Some habits which become automated are good habits and some habits are not, not good habits, just as some, the content of your routine might be. These are a little more technical terms, but I think one has to look and, and say where, what aspect of my life is it work? Is it my work life? Is it my personal life? Uh, where is it disrupted and where, and, and where is it that I can begin? And the, the, the thing is that when you begin just to do one small thing in that area, and start mm-hmm. doing it regularly, the way your brain will work is that it will it will give you, so to speak, good feelings as you finish as you do that task. And as you finish that task, you actually in itself gives you meaning and purpose. You know, in the book I in the art of routine, I tell some stories of including my mother's of people that are in crisis, you know, the worst situations that you're in, you're in, you're in crisis. And and you know, I'm I'm sensitive to this not just from whence my parents have come from, but also, I've worked with Direct Relief, uh, which is, I've been the board chair of Direct Relief, which is a billion-dollar organization, probably the top uh, humanitarian organization in the United States. Um, not not Red Cross, but Direct Relief, <laughs> and uh, uh, just plugging it. And you see, for example, the Syrian crisis and refugees that leave war and pestilence, and you see how they're trying to find and have been disrupted from, so to speak, their time bubbles, right? They're trying to find new environment. They're trying to find a way to to live and, and, and leave war and pestilence and the sort. And I only go off of that because that's where you have to begin, you have to begin somewhere, even in the worst situations, to start to start something. Um, one example uh, that maybe might be interesting to you would be that I, you know, I'd met a, a um, an insurance salesman who said to me that uh, his life, his time bubble burst. He says, you know, I was, I know you're writing a book about routine and my life became incredibly disrupted. I became, I became divorced. Um, my wife, I lost custody of my child. I lost my job. I, I became um, very disorganized, unstructured. I couldn't really get in line to get started to put my life back together. Um, and um, and this is what we see also with people who have mental illness in the sort. What do we do in medicine? We create a cocoon. You know, we get you on a time schedule. You know, for anybody who's been in a hospital or otherwise, that everything is about on schedule in the sort. It may not be very much fun to be in a hospital. It's not a hotel. Yeah. But all of that care is about creating a stable environment, stabilizing you and getting you on, on a routine. And he went to the gym, got motivated to try to go to the gym and get exercise. He gained weight. And he happened to come to be next to a, a, a little bit older fellow that uh, was on the treadmill with him. And he got to be friendly with him. And this person was incredibly organized, incredibly structured and routine. And he became friends with him. And just by becoming friends, he says, well, why don't you come tomorrow and you'll come the next day. We'll take a day off <laughs> on Saturday. And he started this you know, exercise routine, which kind of then beget him getting um, – more routine in his life. One of the things that he missed was some companionship in the sort. It's often a prescription that I give. He got, <laughs> what did he get? He got a dog, you know? And boy, the dogs will put you right into a routine. Yeah. Because they've got to, you know, get out uh, and you have to feed him at a certain time. And it's actually uh, very therapeutic. And particularly during the pandemic, I was reading in Seattle, there are more dogs than there are uh, the population now in Seattle. Wow. And you know all of the uh, all of the the the, uh, uh, the kennels and the shelters, have, many of them become empty. People in this time of uncertainty, of being you know so to speak stuck at home, changing of routines have done this. So, um, how do you make that coherent? I think you have to break it down to, you know, your work life, your personal life, 
and then look at the health related look at the health related uh, types of things. So, um, excuse me, I thought I had this uh, closed off over here. Um, anyway, so um, so uh, it's not an in, it's not a simple answer. It's hard to get a one two three. Yeah, it depends on on the the situation. But let's say, for example, one of the things about diets. Okay, people. Um, um, you know, we're being bombarded. What's the right diet, the right way to eat the best way. And, yeah. you know, you're getting as I call zoomed all the time about all kinds of uh, information. Is it the South beach diet? Cause I'm trying to lose weight. Is it the paleo diet that makes <laughs> me feel better? Um, uh, what should I do? And part of what's missing is that's the content and humans are very adaptive. Well, we may need to concentrate more than just whatever it is we do doing it regularly and sticking with it. Yeah, you know, I'm not suggesting a beef jerky diet. Don't get me wrong; my topic <laughs> will get in will get in the way. But you know, in in previous times before uh, we had uh, really this movement to greater wealth, you know, in, in the world, the world's changed significantly in a hundred years regarding poverty. If you if you read yeah. Rosling's book Factfulness, um, um, which shows you how how we the way we perceive the world today compared to what it really was, we still perceive it as we are light years off of what used to be called poverty a hundred years ago. Yeah. Um, and running water, you know, on and on vaccinations and the sort. So these are, you know, these are the, um, the things that we have to, you know, kind of focus that we're very adaptable. The Eskimos ate blubber in their environment and we surely couldn't eat that level of fat intake for our livers. But over time, they became adaptable to their environment. So we're adaptable. We look for equilibrium and homeostasis. There's a science behind it. And I think that some of the best therapy for today's um, overly, um, you know, distractive world um, is to try to do things, stabilize and do things in a more regular basis, not just go and keep trying every new thing that you're being pitched or here. Yeah. You know. I I want to step back here. I, I think that one of the struggles that many people are dealing with right now, and, and I think it's waning a little bit, uh, is the COVID fatigue of my, my entire structure of life, my rhythms of life, my work life, my family life, the, the kids at school life, all of that radically changed. We were fortunate in that we homeschool. My wife and I both work from home. Not much has changed for us overall, but we see our friends, we see people we know, and just how devastating this has been to their life. I wonder though, and, and I'm going to pose a, a question, uh, a thought, and then a question out of this. I wonder if that's not healthy, if that we've had a lot of unhealthy routines in our lives about things that that uh, aren't as significant and we kind of have the shiny object syndrome or we have the uh, just always running, going and doing things that COVID has forced us to slow down, reevaluate. How do values define the art of healthy routine? How do we realign what matters to us to creating routines that actually bring us to success? Well, that's, you know, it's, it's a great question. It's really of the moment today because, you know, one of the things I talk about is the collateral damage mm. that happened, you know, medical damage that's happened yeah. and other damage that's happened. For example, uh, older parents not being able to see their children for a year or even uh, older children in college not even able to to have, you know, so it really disrupted the social fabric, the social yeah. communication. A very, a very emotional thing for humans who are relatively convivial. Yeah. But what you're speaking to is uh, what I, I think is what I call collateral value. Mm. Because I think in, in times of uncertainty, just like refugees that are migrating with, from war and pestilence, in essence, this is pestilence, right? This is disease, right? Yeah, yeah. That's afflicted us in the past. It brings out some of these uh, survival concepts to, to survive closer and be closer together. Um, for many people, it's, it's realized the value of the family and those routines that, of course, for you, they seem to have been already somewhat internalized. But for other people, they began to discover that 
you know, my goodness, you know, I used to run off, send my kids to daycare, come back off. The home was a place to meet up, have some food, you know, watch some TV and go to bed and start over again uh, at work. I was moving in and out otherwise. And suddenly that uh, family structure, whatever it might be, is, is suddenly together, right? And suddenly that there's communication that really wasn't happening before, right? Mm-hmm. And I think these bring on the, the value of family, I think is one of the collateral values that's been learned. Um, I think we've also learned what we miss, mm. that we miss some of these social, we miss hugging and, and touching and kissing and, 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 and being together. And, and maybe for some people, you know, it's interesting for me, it's like I had somebody just recently tell me, because I was dealing with what's been the value of this. And they said to me, you know, the value is that I kind of found out who my real friends are. Wow. You know, who, who really made an effort, even though it was virtual, to mm-hmm. communicate mm-hmm. or really tried to call me and said, let's be six feet apart and take a walk, you know, yeah. Yeah. or ask me how, you were do- how we were doing. Um, so there's been, a, 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 I think, a lot of collateral value that comes when we kind of huddle back to our survival instincts, essentially of routine and environment. Another thing that's happened that's of, of value is that um, I think you have you were already in it personally in a setting that already valued your environment, but a lot of people suddenly are sitting in their homes and saying, God, I've got to make this nicer. Yeah. I, yeah. I Why didn't I, why have I not changed out that old couch? You know, I've been, to, <laughs> now I have to sit on it for two or three hours. I never sat on it, but for a half hour before. And you've seen kind of this in, interesting boom on your environment, your home environment in particular, uh, where there's been a, a rush onto real estate and, and safety, how the home environment furnishings, uh, upgrading for those that can, and those that can't trying to find something that gave them shelter, yeah. shelter from the storm, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think there's been a lot of value. And I think there's a little bit of like the moonshot on this, like the moonshot to the moon, a number of things came that changed us forever. Mm-hmm. And I think that's going to happen now, whether mm-hmm. it's a change in how our hygiene habits are, you know, but we're going to have to overcome as we open up, we're going to have to overcome what I call viral threats because we've been now conditioned by, by this pandemic to view everyone as a viral threat. Yeah. And which is a really bad place to view people from. It, it is. It is a, b- a bad place. It's not conducive to how we are as humans, and it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, obviously, some people, are, are arguably younger of the younger demographics, it doesn't stop them. But I think older people were fearful, and parents for their children have been fearful. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to take a little time to how do you overcome, you know, the viral threat. Yeah. But there's been a lot of collateral value to your to your point. Now, the book, The Art of Routine, out May 18th of 2021. When people read this book, what do you want them to take out of it? What are they going to be left with? They finish the book. What next? I think that I'm hoping that they recognize through some of the stories that we tell tell, and uh, the stories that that come that illustrate that it's okay to be in a time bubble. It's yeah. okay because you're gonna. It's not going to be there all the time. That we live our lives really through these types of 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 stresses, right? But we we strive for having stability. It's okay to have routine, and um, it, it's okay to have stability and to do things regularly. And and even when you look at artists or creative people, you see that even in their creation, they've got a a great routine. I was talking on a recent podcast to uh, writers and artists and telling them about whoever, whoever it might be, how, when you really study artists and how they created, that it's not just the spontaneous um, unstructured, you know, moment that occurs in their life. And that's because their the body doesn't work that way. I was just yeah. looking at a PBS series on, on, um, on Hemingway who would write early in the morning when there was a lot of energy and cognitiveness and he was very quiet and then by two o'clock he finished and he, he was considered a good father because then he was available. He's like a stockbroker here in, uh, 
in, in the West Coast, you know, get up early at five, you're done at 1.30 or two, and then you could be a good dad. So, um, so I think that's, that's one thing that you'll learn. In the last chapter, uh, I try to bring in a little bit more about artificial intelligence. Yeah. And how is that, um, that working? I, you know, I chair this uh, analytics company that we're doing work in healthcare analytics, trying to be do predictive analytics to help support. And as you know, artificial intelligence is something we uh, we've developed. Artificial intelligence is not an alien that's come down. So this is our creation. But in the book, as we look towards the future, as you said, I we look at technology and ask the question. Um, and one of the terms that I that I uh, I talk briefly about is called techmanity. It's actually a, a term that I've seen in the investment world, mm-hmm. companies that are the intersection between technology and humanity. And, um, and these are companies, for example, in, in big data, uh, in genomics, in artificial intelligence. When you apply those to healthcare, we're now seeing that these, these strives are beginning to make us think that we may be immortal, the ability to understand and be predictive to get the kind of data and apply it to genomics where we can make our lives longer. I mean, some people say that all things equal, that if you're born today, you have a 50% chance chance of of living up to a hundred, Yeah, you know, from the way our knowledge is increasing. So that's a little bit of the future. And uh, will our ability to monitor our bodies, which now a lot of technology is, is starting to be able to monitor how we are. And if you apply an artificial intelligence uh, algorithm to it, it may tell us and predict what our best routines actually would be for us when our bodies do what they like to do when they're less stressed. So there's a, there's definitely a a new era in this, this kind of intersection of technology and humanity that is the next event after understanding our, our human nature uh, to find a, you know, stability and equilibrium in the sort. So that, I believe that's the next, uh, the next episode, so to speak. Nice. As we wrap up this first part of the uh, show, uh, we want to know how can people find, connect with you and get this book? Well, that's great. Well, you know, I've got all the handles, you know, with uh, LinkedIn and Facebook <laughs> and Twitter, and obviously there's that, but the book is uh, now available for pre-order on Amazon and on Barnes and Noble and all of the booksellers, including Skyhorse Publishing and uh, and uh, Simon and & Schuster, and they're all available for pre-order. And, uh, you know, we're trying to just uh, let people know a little bit about it, you know, kind of gain some interest. Uh in it, I think that uh, it'll be an interesting human insight. There are a few prescriptive concepts. You know, some people would like to have a, a simple prescription. It's not, but I think um, as uh, as we develop this 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 kind of aspect of our human nature, I think it'll help people uh, maybe uh, focus and declutter a bit. So, but I hope the book does that. The links to the book and to uh, On Hill you'll find in the episode notes. So. You can check them right there. It's not going to be hard to get to. You just click on the button and it will take you there. So go check out the book, get it and read it. We're going to take a break here. When we come back, we are going to do rapid fire questions. We'll be right back. Some of you have noticed a big change here at JumbleThink, and I quickly wanted to address it. We have recently dropped down to one episode a week. It's not because we're lacking in guests or interviews or conversation. It's just simply we are excited about the future and working hard to make a better show for you. I want to let you know that you don't have anything to worry. We're going to be bringing back two episodes a week in the near future. But until then, make sure you check out each new episode each week. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions. Ce disque sera pour vous un rempart contre la fatigue. We are back with On Hill. All right, are you ready for rapid fire questions? I, I am, but I'm not sure that how quick, how rapid they are, or how rapid my mind will be to answer them. As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a gaucho. I okay. grew up in Argentina. So that there you go. How do you define success personally? I think that um, 
success still becomes uh, setting a goal, juking and jiving to it, and accomplishing it. If somebody has a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start, what should they do? It's pretty obvious. Start with a small routine and it will grow on you and you will have success. What is one book you think every dreamer should read? Ooh, of course, I'd say The Art of Routine <laughs> um, in that regard. But I think that uh, Factfulness, um, oh. which is a book that I've had here nearby by Hans Rosling, is a, is a really great book that will give you a perspective of how much the world has changed. And so if you're going to dream for the future, it's important to understand where we are today relative to the past. And it's a book that, you know, was recommended to me by uh, the uh, former managing chair of McKenzie, mm -hmm. uh, the consulting firm, and, and thought it was one of the more relevant books. Um, uh, and I think it's it, it, it's probably one of the best books. To, he's done a lot of TED Talks, but it's very, very, very insightful if you're a dreamer to understand where your dream will go. What's one thing you wish you would have known when you first started out? Oh, that's a good, that's a great question. It's a little, it's a little bit of a, not a positive question is, but that it, it, I wish I'd known that there was another side to humans that mm. wasn't always all good. And yeah. that there was a reason why we have the social mores and upbringing that we do. Because sometimes I, I wonder how is it that we follow the traffic lights and get in, get in line for the ATMs and, in line for dinner and don't uh, beat ourselves up. <laughs> so I wish I'd known that a little bit better. What is one trend you're currently excited about? I'm, uh, I'm, ex I'm excited about, and, and it's because I'm involved with it about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and how we can assure that it's going to be used in a, in a good ethical and moral way to evolve us as humans, as opposed to devolve us. What is one habit you find helpful in your life? Um, one habit that's a very useful for myself is um, doing an affirmation every morning that reviews something positive that's going to be happening through, throughout the day. And it's done habitually and regularly. Love that. Our final rapid fire question today is, what is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? That's a really, that's a really good question. But, you know, we talked a little bit about piloting and it, it, it may be getting rated in a, in a small jet. I okay. may want to, if I could figure out a way to do that, to maybe complete that, uh, that part of, of, uh, of that skill set. And so we always like to leave the guest have a final thought. What do you want to leave all of us with who are listening today? I think that, um, and obviously, in, in speaking to the subject matter, that uh, one needs to be understand that even in the worst of situations or when you think you're lost or you're not organized or you're not succeeding in having a goal, that if you understand a little bit about your body and then how we're wired for routine and regularity, that it will be it will be sought and just let it let it occur. And, you know, you got to push a little bit to get there, but that there's always hope. And uh, and that you will be successful in uh, in your uh, in your dreams and what you hope to do. Thanks so much for taking time out and sharing about the new book, giving us some uh, great insights about the power of routine and how it can actually be a a powerful tool in our lives. And uh, for sharing your story. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great pleasure. Once again, I want to thank Dr. I for joining us here on Jumble Think. You can find his links in the episode notes, including the link to the book. Go check out the book. It's a fascinating read. I also want to thank you for tuning into today's conversation. It means the world to us that you would listen. And beyond that, I hope today's conversation has sparked a little desire to change your routine. One from living in a world of comfort to maybe one chasing the unknown, going out and chasing your dreams. We believe you were created for something awesome, that your dreams and ideas matter, but it's up to you. You are the one that has to choose to chase those ideas, to create those dreams, to live the life that you were created to live. So that's my challenge. Get out there today, dream big, and change the world around you. Sur les côtés. 
vous êtes une autre personne. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois, lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.